I think we are over an hour in. We're going to keep going here. I have not looked at these once, which I always say right. is the sign of a good interview. But I have to look at them because I want to talk some math stuff that's probably going to go over my head. And some of these phrases, by uh -oh. the way, are Bring spectacular. It. Let's start uh, with the E8 and Tits Freudenthal Magic Square. Wow. I Googled that. Okay. Tits Freudenthal. Very funny to me. Very strange. Yeah. I was what in math hell? for a long time. Nobody ever made the obvious joke. <laughs> ever. And it's all ma all male group. I what, swear to God. What does that say about math people yeah, and humor? That we can be trusted. Apparently. Yeah. Um, no, all right. So I want to knock out just a couple just interesting mathematical theories sure. and, and some other stuff. And I, I have a few here. Uh, let, let's start there because I want to impart some of this because, as I said at the top, this is not my department knowing about this kind of stuff. So what in God's name is the E8 and Tits Freud and Thal Magic square. You're already looking around because well, you want an example of something. So you have these. You have these. Uh, origami. Very symmetrical origami shapes. Yeah, my grandma made them. So this is living in three dimensions, and we would call its symmetries a group. And the problem is that um, there are very strange isolated sets of symmetries that don't act in three dimensions, but act in uh, very high dimensions. So 52, 133, the largest of these strange objects is called E8, and it acts in 248 dimensions. So it's like the monolith in 2001, it shows up, we have no knowledge of why it's there. Mm -hmm. The average human being has never worried about it because they don't know it exists. We have no idea what it's symmetrizing because it only seems to symmetrize itself. Hmm. And the, the Tits Freudenthal magic square is this collection of symmetries that are generated by some procedure, and it's almost as if it's a message from pure design, from pure um, order, and nobody knows what it means. And so this is something that we should be worrying about. This is like, you know, if I were running the NSF, I would say, why are we not putting money into these four very strange objects called F4, E6, E7, and E8 to try to figure out what they are telling us? We know that they're at the center of mathematics, and, mm. the, uh, and at another level, they're like the platypuses to mammals. They're so different and so strange that we have effectively no understanding of them. Yeah, uh, this is gonna maybe sound like a stupid question, but so this is understood purely at a at a theoretical level, or this is understood at a literal level, like it's, it, this idea has been We proven? can construct them. We, oh, okay, that, that's what I'm asking. Mathematically, yeah. but we yeah. can't fit them but we in can't, here. Yeah. So we can't build them, I can't build you a model. Right. Um, and we don't know, all, all indications are that these should be absolutely central to mathematics, mm -hmm. and maybe even to physics. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a, a, a friend of ours, uh, also a rival, uh, who lives in Maui, uh, has built a theory of everything yeah. uh, around this, this object E8. Mm -hmm. um, we know that the symmetries of our universe seem to generate all four of the fundamental forces. And so symmetries and physics are closely intertwined. Now the question is, does does physics somehow come out from these very strange objects? So do you start with the most complicated, simple objects of a type, um, and then try to recover our world? Or do you try instead to start with an extremely simple object and have the complexity of our world emerge? And so these are, you know, the, I've taken that route, right. uh, trying to think about physics, but these are things that people should at least know exist and with your viewer base, hopefully a couple of kids are gonna Google these things and say, holy crap, <laughs> uh, and spend the rest of their life trying to bring it home for us. Or they're gonna go, man, Dave's looking at him like, he has no freaking clue what he's saying. Right? Nobody does. Yeah. You're in the same boat as I am. I mean, I'm all I can picture as you're talking about this, I, I can understand what you're saying in a, in a certain sense, but I am picturing the monolith from 2001. So it's the idea of something that is Packed with itself or something. Something and that's, is so and that's the perfect pure everything. and strange and with no, it doesn't come with an instruction manual, right? We just, yeah. we can prove that it's there. Yeah. You know, so for example, uh, Plato had these five solids, uh, the platonic solids. It turns out that in dimension four, 
all of them have an analog, but there's a new one that had never been thought of and wasn't understood until the 1800s that it existed mathematically, uh, called the 24 cell. So these are these puzzles where, you know, if you were a religious-minded person, you might think that th these are messages from a creator that have not been decoded. Mm -hmm. And if you're a, a different sort of person, you think, well, these are undoubtedly structural elements that have not been uh, tied together with uh, the major themes of mathematics. So probably they unlock something amazing. And if you were Indiana Jones, you would try to find them, but you wouldn't necessarily... That's beautiful, I hadn't thought of that. ...believe in them. Right. But pro I think he kind of believed in a lot of this stuff. Yeah, and, and so that's, that's one of the things, is that it, it takes a certain level of confidence to say, I'm going to pursue this because there's no indication you know, what, what are you going to get from the monolith? Is it going to make better toast or, you know? Um, right. Or do you become one with the universe or... Nobody understands the last seat. Exactly. Or... You just end up in a bed as an old man and somewhere beyond the, siren, the sirens of Titan. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the theory of everything, which uh, was a movie last year, but also is beyond just the movie. What the mm -hmm. hell is the theory of everything? Um, well, um, it's the source code. Whatever, we're, you and I are talking in something that I, uh, referencing the matrix, call the construct. And the construct isn't some fake computer program. It's <coughs> uh, the geometric underpinnings of what we would call quantum field theory and the theory of gravity. And these two theories are known to be uh, flawed in some sense. And so they're not complete. And yet, there's no way that we currently have of having a single graceful and elegant theory that particularizes to both of these. That is what obsesses me, which is we are the artificial intelligence that lives inside of this differential geometric construct. And our job is to figure out what is our own source code. So we sort of did this at one level with, let's, let's say, DNA or the theory of selection from Darwin. So humans have been trying to figure out progressively, okay, what is this place? Where are we having this conversation with the Rubin report? Right. Right? And the idea... You mean it's not just L.A.? It might be deeper than that? Oh, it, yeah. It could, oh, could, it's deeper. Yeah. yeah, it could be Simi Valley. You don't know. Yeah. But um, I think that what it is is it's the greatest puzzle ever. This is, this is the main story. Can we understand each level of our source code right down to the machine code. Do you think we can actually get there? Well, that's an awkward question because I think that I'm, I'm, I'm gambling that I've broken through something which could, could put me pretty close. So let's talk about that thing. All right. This was about three years ago? Three and a half. About, I said about three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you're a mathematician, it has to be very precise. So can you explain what you did about three years ago that flipped some of Einstein's stuff? Sure. Um, so when I was uh, a young guy, I watched string theory um, start to bubble up. In 1984, there was a discovery, and there was a lot of desperation because for about 10 years, theoretical physics had been stalled. And I looked at string theory and I said, this is fascinating, it's really interesting, and it doesn't feel right. And I bet the whole field is going to go down this path. At least this, Give me String Theory 101 just for... String Theory 101 says that your concept of the world is not uh, a theory of waves built on idealized little balls, but instead you imagine some sort of rubber band-like geometric structures, and then you build waves in some sense on top of that rather than on, on point particles. And... Very quickly, it starts to get greedy, and it demands, I want to live in 26 dimensions, or I want to live in 10 dimensions, maybe 11. I want to have these supersymmetric aspects, uh, which has to do with a symmetry between force and matter. And the problem is, is that it feels intellectually like a check-kiting scheme, where you're constantly repairing something, but you're opening up a new can of worms. And I don't think that's solvent at the moment. That uh, nobody's figured out how to get this this game to close and to rejoin what we think of as experimentally verified physics. So I think I was early saying this is madness mm. and I went into mathematics in order to avoid 
what I saw is like the tulip uh, bubble uh, of string theory. Huh. And so what I believed was that actually um, the hardest thing is to unthink Einstein because Einstein laid the groundworks. When we, we talk about string theory, we still think about space and time as space-time. Mm -hmm. And there's something wrong at that level, but there's nothing to correct. It's, it's so elementary that it's as if there's no room to fix him. Right, you'd have to untie a gajillion other things, basically. Or so it seems, yeah. right? And so what I, what I did was I tried to spot a couple of things that people had, in my opinion, misthunk. Um, about the geometric underpinnings. There were, there were some discoveries in the mid-1970s um, by Jim Simons, the world's most successful hedge fund manager, and C.N. Yang, arguably the greatest living theoretical physicist, where they figured out a dictionary between mathematics, uh, particularly geometry, and theoretical physics, which has spawned a revolution that is now 40 years old, hmm. right? And so, some of the equations that came out of that I saw as capable of replacing Einstein's field equations, which are very elegant and, again, have this, this feature of locking out any attempt to play with them. So if you think about the world that we see around us as currently understood by physics, there are three main equations. Einstein field equations, there's the souped up Maxwell's equations called Yang-Mills, and then there's something called the Dirac equation for matter. And those three equations are, in some sense, provably the simplest equations in their classes. So we're a little bit stumped because it feels like, okay, there's nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. We've searched the room for our keys. We cannot find them. And we can almost say that they can't be here. But that's not quite true. So the, the way I saw it is, is that physics conceived of a battle between Einstein and Bohr, relativity and quantum mechanics. And in fact, what we found was is that Einstein was derived from a kind of geometry called Riemannian geometry. And only recently, in the 1970s, did we find out that quantum mechanics seems to come from a different geometry, from a guy named Erishman, so Erishmanian geometry. And so what I did is I said, I don't think it's a, f a battle between Einstein and Bohr. I think it's a battle between uh, Riemann and Erishman. And the question is, is there any geometry known that can incorporate the advantages of both of these two different kinds of geometries. And in generically, there isn't. But in a very special case, you can marry them and get something new. And when I was in graduate school, we thought that there were only 16 particles in what we call a generation that mostly makes up this construct. But it turned out that neutrinos had a little bit of mass, and that meant that there was an extra possible particle from 15 to 16 particles. So we thought 15, now 16. And if you have two to the, two to the n particles, so in this case two to the fourth, there's a new kind of geometry that combines Erishmanian geometry and Riemannian geometry that might govern our world. And so I, what I believe is, is that um, physicists have an, an economic incentive to study the generic cases, because that's what you can build a career on. Mm -hmm. But our world may be the most particular of cases, and so it's a sort of a one-way suicide pact. Either it's gonna work or it isn't. Right. And so I, I went a non-economic route, which was sort of self-destructive. <laughs> but then uh, I wound up... Eric, I am not going to pretend that I fully understood all of I'm that. But I got some of it. Okay. How about that? That's a start, right? You got to start somewhere. It's a, it's a new... I'm, I'm doing like the Einstein thing. You got to start somewhere. Exactly. And we'll, and we'll go from there. Uh, you know, uh, all right, so I got one more for you. Sure. Uh, the edge question, which ah. is a question that goes out to about, uh, what is it, about 200, about 200. Uh, public intellectuals per year. Is public intellectuals fair to say? Uh, sounds, it's always kind. Posers, <laughs> fakers, and uh, blowhards. A bunch of schnooks uh, yeah, yeah, get this question. John Brockman does a beautiful job of assembling some of the more interesting minds, and uh, I somehow snuck in, and I've remained in every year but one for the last seven or so years. So every year, at the end of the year, he sends out this question to all of these people, and he asks them to respond, and then they post all their answers right. publicly. You were one of the 200 or so people. I want to get the question absolutely right. Uh, the edge question of the year of 2016 was, what scientific term or concept 
should be more widely known. Right. What was your answer to that? So I, I deliberated. It's very similar to the question he asked in 2011, what would improve everyone's cognitive toolkit? And I said professional wrestling and kayfabe because my <laughs> wife told me, <laughs> might as well take the risk. Yeah. But so this year, well, you were what definitely I did, right about the professional wrestling exactly. thing because you explained it with Trump. So there you go. Um, in 2017, I chose uh, Russell conjugation, and Russell conjugation was so we were talking uh, privately before about the need to push out new language to uh, understand our world. No, oh, okay. I'm glad you're ending with this. I was going to do a bonus thing with you, so we'll do it. We'll do it right now. Okay. So the the thing that I I was searching for was what word should I use. It sounds like synonym, where two words are content synonyms, but maybe emotionally antonyms. Mm -hmm. So a good one is fink and whistleblower, mm -hmm. right? And so I asked this question on Quora, and people said, "Oh, it's you know, it's loaded speech." I said, "No, no, no, it's too general." Finally, somebody, I think in Florida, wrote in and said, "You're looking for emotive conjugation or Russell conjugation." It turns out Bertrand Russell had been here earlier, and in 1948. He was on the BBC, um, and he said, let's look at the construction. I am firm, you are obstinate, he, she, or it is a pig-headed fool. And that, that was just a moment where I said, oh my gosh, I don't realize that I have been given no extra information about the three conjugations that he's gone through, and yet I feel differently. I like the fact that somebody is firm and steadfast, and I dislike the fact that somebody is pig-headed. Uh -huh. And then I realized that this could actually be weaponized and as part of an arms race, that maybe the newspapers were in fact conjugating uh, president, strongman, dictator. Mm -hmm. And so I remembered this uh, very strange phrase from years past, Panamanian strongman, Manuel Noriega. <laughs> and I thought, who would come up with a construction that awkward uh, and always invariant? Uh -huh. And then everyone repeats it. And then everyone it. uses it. Exactly. Constantly. Hawkish. He's hawkish. Right. Or a controversial businessman was, was applied to a friend of mine, uh, Declan Ganley, who had uh, fought the Lisbon Treaty in the EU. And at some point they removed controversial businessman, so he just became businessman Declan Ganley. And so what I, what I came to understand is, is that the big boys don't play around with faking the facts. What they realized is that we have multiple opinions on everything but our emotional state selects which opinion and the person who figured this out uh, uh, is Frank Luntz and Frank Luntz is a Republican pollster it, he, there's a video of him where he asks people you know what do you think about uh, undocumented workers and like oh you know the, they're doing a great job and we have to recognize their contribution well do you support illegal alien no no no, no they no, should no, be no, deported no. Yeah. And in an instant, and then you see that the mind doesn't see itself. It's having two reactions to death tax and estate tax. <laughs> it's the same object. Right. And so we are both for and against everything. And so while we're watching information, they're not looking at information. They're looking at the emotional shading because our emotions pick out which of our multiple opinions we're actually going to act on. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm... Uh, pointing to here is that this is the language that you need to get underneath the constructed world that you're presented with. Mm -hmm. And what I hope is that this essay is going to show people that you can code up a computer program to crawl text with, against a table of Russell conjugates to figure out what the exact bias is of any news source. Huh. I don't need to know about Breitbart is conservative. Let me crawl it. Let's just look at the buzzwords. Let's, Let's look at the Write language. a Python program, use regular expressions, grab the text, match it against the table, and I'll tell you exactly what you're being told to feel. Mm -hmm. Irrespective, you can be trusted with the knowledge. What you can't be trusted with is your feelings because yeah. the feelings determine the opinion. And so this is the great binary weapon. The information superhighway had very little effect relative to what we were expecting because it needs the second emotional component. There's no emotional superhighway to go next to it. This is so fascinating because it's so everything that's happening right now and it actually does, maybe this is the unifying principle of our entire conversation because it fits within the fake news thing. It fits within the algorithm thing. It fits within trying to talk about, talk about honestly, talk honestly about difficult issues. I mean, it's all, it's all right there.
Well, th you think about it like this. If, if you're going to trust somebody, like a physician, to put you under and operate on you, you want to have a lot of previous discussions so that you feel that person is aligned with you. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get uh, the power tools into the hands of the people who've not been trusted with them and to say, hey, I want to upgrade my relationship. I don't really want to kill the New York Times. I want the New York <laughs> Times to learn how to respect people who are as smart or smarter than the editors who drive the narratives, than the reporters who go out and report. And I want them to come to see themselves as part of the problem and part of the story, which is, please stop with the editorial headlines. Yeah, everything's editorialized now. Right, and, and stop with the narratives. And you're going to have to be in partnership because you don't have the gatekeeping ability anymore. And previously, we democratized information, but we kept turning to the New York Times, please tell me how to feel. Those aren't revolutions in Tahrir Square, those are demonstrations, right? And so I was the one who was off of social media, I was saying, I'm watching a revolution. But in New York, when I went to a party, people would say, what are you talking about, it's a demonstration, yeah. right? And so these conjugates. Then they realized after Mubarak went down that it was a revolution. No. no? This is the amazing part about it. It's only when you actually hear the authoritative oh. source that you've empowered right. to switch the language that you actually feel safe. Because what happens is if you just take what you see and then you go into your social group, you will find that you will be instantly ostracized. Yeah. And so what we've been, we've been depending on the New York Times, not for information, we've been depending upon it for to tell us what's safe to feel. With whom should I empathize? Who should I consider a pariah? Who should I hug to my bosom? And this is the thing that we're now going to break through. So 2016 was the year when that started to crumble. Yeah, so let's just go through a couple words that, we've, that we've discussed and that you've been part of. Uh, so first off, the, the word bigoteer. I had Tim Ferriss on, and I think he came up with the phrase when you were on his podcast. And basically it was this idea of what these social justice warriors are doing is not good. They are finding bigotry everywhere and they are cheering bigotry because that is the ultimate uh, virtue signaling goodness. Well, it's a and, hunting license for people that you disagree with, right? right. That you can, anybody I can label a bigot, I'm allowed to hunt. Yeah, so I love the fact that I've been pushing it out a little bit now and I see it starting to gain a little traction. So that's one, and then one that you actually came up with uh, on your, on Sam Harris's podcast was steel manning, which I thought was strange. not mine. Oh, that's not yours. No, no, no. Oh, I'm giving I'm giving you who? No, I, no, no. Oh, that that, I, that uh... comes from uh, sort of the rationality community that I run with. I'm, I'm a huge on attribution. I think it's important. Oh, absolutely. So, so I they didn't taught mean it to, to me. Attribute. Oh, all right. So do do you know who actually came up with it? I think I first heard it. Uh, from the first person I heard use it powerfully was Jan Tallinn, who. Uh, is a, a brilliant Estonian who uh, coded up Skype oh, wow. uh, and just a, an all-around very deep thinker. Um, well, now but, I know you're very honest because I was, I was attributing it to you. Much so. as I wish I could claim credit. Yeah, but, you right. know, I think that, you know, for example, one thing I've been focused on is uh, long, short um, positions. So the mm -hmm. idea that your long support for Muslims and your short support for Islamists where those things sound very similar to most people, <laughs> right? Right, But the idea of pulling apart um, something that's good from something that sounds similar to it, but is in fact very dangerous, mm -hmm. uh, is something that we are going to be doing. And that's, I think, one of the things that we're going to give is our, our gift to the dialogue. How do you hold these nuanced positions? And we've talked before, but there seem to be about 20, 25 people who can try to do this in public without falling off the A-frame roof where they're dancing on rationality. And if you fall this direction, you end up as a troglodyte. And if you end up this direction, you end up with political correctness. Right. So almost no one can manage to do this because the forces are making it impossible. So I think that long, short uh, thinking, which is taking the marketplace of ideas and treating it as we treat market, the marketplace of investment. Of anything else. Right. Yeah, all right, I love that. I'm gonna start using that. Uh, let's just backtrack though to, to steel manning real quick, even though you didn't come sure. up with it. But I, but I think it's such an important piece of what's going on here because we know that in the public space there are so many people who do the reverse of that. They straw man. Well, this is, and steel manning is basically uh, laying out your opposition's 
ideas in the clearest, most concise ways so that you can attack them properly, right? I mean, that's the idea. You are steel manning their position so that you can then disassemble it fairly and honestly, as opposed to what we see so many people doing these days, which is making up a person's position and then attacking the non position. Right, so the, I, I talk about liberal clairvoyance where uh, a lot of uh, the left believes that if you state even a little bit of your position, oh, I know why you hold that position because you <laughs> secretly dislike this and you're for that terrible thing. And it's, so in this idiom, um, one of the things is, is that I look at very smart people. I think Glenn Greenwald is a very smart guy. I like a lot of stuff that he's done. I think Reza Aslan could be very impressive. And what happens with these folks is, is that they straw man repeatedly um, and they try to find the most powerful argument for their, for their readership. And you, you look at Sam and Sam, uh, whatever you think his faults may be, is frequently trying to steel man somebody who is straw manning his position. And that is the sine qua non of, that's the ante to get into the the higher level conversations. And I know I'm gonna take a tremendous amount of uh, guff on Twitter for that, but that's what I'm signed up for because I believe that fundamentally, uh, it's not just about attacking your opponent's position. Sometimes I'll steel man somebody's position, I'll say, you know what, I don't think they had the best version of that, but now that I see what they may be saying, um, maybe I'm even moved. And I think that it's really important um, to sort of extend that as a courtesy uh, and a, a, as a grace. But what do you do though when that courtesy is not extended back to you repeatedly? So without getting into Glenn and Reza, who I right. think most of my audience knows their, their bad intentions. I mean, I could even think of other examples where just in the last couple of days, you know, I saw uh, Judd Apatow and Sarah Silverman. Both of them, right. I really like Judd's from the same town as me, we went to the same high school. I like both of their work. Uh, I saw them tweeting about how Simon and Schuster should get rid of Milo's book. Now, that would, these are people who are comedians that are supposed to be getting to the edge and crossing it and being right. edgy and all of this stuff. And I said, I tweeted at them and I said, you know, I'd love, I have Milo coming on in a couple of weeks. I'd love to have you guys sit down. We'll have a conversation. I didn't mean it as a debate. I'm not attacking. I like Milo. I like Judd. I like Sarah. All this stuff. Now, they didn't respond to me and I suspect that they won't respond to me. But that does make our job as people willing to extend the, the uh, fig leaf a little more. The fig leaf? Is it a fig leaf? The fig leaf? <laughs> I would say olive branch. Well, the olive branch, the fig leaf, that's something else. But yeah, the, I, was, I was going with the fig leaf for some reason. But for those of us that are willing to extend that, willing to have those conversations, willing to, to do the intellectual work to make the world better, if it's not handed back to you, and I'm, not, I'm giving a bit of a stretch with sure. my position on the two of them, maybe they've responded to me while we're talking right now. But, it does make our work a little bit harder, right? Well, let's try to steel man their position, uh, which uh, is a sign of good faith. I think that in part, we haven't pushed out the language. We haven't pushed out the toolkit. And as a result, everybody is fumbling around with language that was barely adequate in the 1980s. It totally doesn't make sense now. And I'm not positive that all of these people will stay where they are. I, I think that it's quite possible that when we stop focusing just on the intellectual, and of course I'm guilty of intellectualizing everything, um, but we start to come more into contact with our own humanity and, and pushing out some of the empathy and emotion. Um, when I was on Sam's podcast, for example, uh, he started talking about the beauty of uh, the poetry of Rumi and the, uh, the call to prayer as being one of the most beautiful uh, songs uh, you know, that one hears all the time in the Middle East, uh, uh, which is you know central to Islam. Yeah, it's and pretty so, horrible. I think I, I've been the call to, to prayer. Yeah, it's pretty. I'm, I'm extremely moved by it. Yeah, yeah. I heard you say that. I thought it's pretty obnoxious in the middle of the day, four times, and all this. It's just annoying. We had a different reaction. Yeah. I lived in Jerusalem yeah. for a couple of years, but yeah. what I what I find is is that when we show that we are empathic, that we understand, you know, Reza's in a tough spot. And that's hard for me to say because I really don't like the way he savages. But he's in a tough spot. And, you know, Glenn Greenwald probably thinks at some level that he's doing the right thing. And I'm pretty unhappy with the biasedness of some of those arguments. But I find that when I extend a certain amount of just, I muster any grace I can to, to listen and to not react, um, 
once people feel a, a level of security in the conversation, they say, you know, I can climb down from these battle positions. I thought you were saying this, and so I had to make this move. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're gonna get everybody that way. But I think what part of what the problem is is that we have to be more willing to be emotionally vulnerable, which is not the easiest thing for a middle-aged, hard-charging, uh, you know, male, but I'm trying, and I'm trying to do it on Twitter, and I'm finding that I'm able to say things that are quite dif difficult with so far a minimal amount of blowback, in part by just being slower on the draw, not mm. thinking about these as enemies, thinking that we are in some confused state, and that it's the language and th the impoverished nature of the language that's keeping us trapped here. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I'm up for a good fight if if I'm really looking at the enemy, but some of these people, like you were saying about Sarah Silverman, right? She, she's making some bad calls, in my opinion, and I just think the world of some of you know, some of the comedy and the insight and and the decency and the bravery. So something has gone wrong, and I think it's up to us, in part, not to fight it out, but to try to figure out well what went wrong logically. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's exactly why I, I even phrased the tweet in a specific way where I didn't say debate, I said conversation, because I wouldn't make it a debate. I think at the end of the day, Milo and, and Judd and, and Sarah could all sit down and actually be okay, I really do, even if they don't agree on every political this or that. Well, this that's, is one of the reasons that I was so excited to come here, because I forget what the original title of Casablanca was, but it's like everybody comes to Rick's or yeah. something like that. <laughs> and I feel like, strangely, uh, this particular home studio is the crossroads of this new emerging sensibility, which is that you have a lot of people on, some of whom should be you know, allied, some of whom should be antagonistic. And what you're doing is you're providing a substrate where it is safe to hash some of these things out. Now, people are going to interpret what's going on here very differently. Oh my sure. God, <laughs> he had Milo and Cernovich. He, you know, he's gone completely crazy, alt-right, right wing. Yeah. But I don't think that's what's happening. I think that what's happening is, is that the world is going to wake up to the fact that we're having an inauthentic conversation and this is the germ uh, of a new way of being uh, which dovetails with older ways of being that have been lost. You might say that this very room is the tits Frudenthal of the thing. You might say that. I, mm -hmm. I can't get away with it. I might say it because I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. There you go. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you, of course. And I got a whole bunch more here, but we'll do this again. How about that? Love to. All right. Thanks yeah. for having us. On that note, you can check out more of Eric's work. Oh, you know what we'll do? We'll put his answer to the edge question. We're going to link to it right down below. And can I pimp out your website? Uh, you, you said it was a throwback, so I don't yeah, want to pimp out something. I think, I think we'll, maybe my Twitter feed or... He's on the Twitter, it's just at Eric Weinstein, right? At, at Eric R. Weinstein. At Eric R. Weinstein, and thanks for watching. We'll do it again next week.